Hey guys, welcome back. And in this video here, I just want to kind of really expand upon that first video that I did here on really the fact that they're going to be spraying an insecticide here pretty much all over our city here in, in Mississauga. And that video that I did, it got quite a bit of traction out there and I'm quite happy to see that. It's great to see that more and more people are becoming aware of, of what's going on here. And people are really questioning the health and safety of this too. And not just people here in Mississauga, there's been people really all around the world kind of reaching out to uh, Jesse and I about this. And it's really fantastic to see. And a lot of people have been kind of moving towards that video I did too about really the fact that Mississauga is going to be the first smart city. So there's a lot of stuff going on here and it's, um, I'm kind of happy to see that a lot of people are really, you know, paying attention to this stuff. But really first and foremost, I got um, a little bit different setup this time. I've got my camera, it's kind of sitting a little bit more stationary and I'm not going to be, uh, I'm going to try my best to not uh, kind of sway back and forth in this video. So I don't want to kind of rock the boat here. So I got a little, little, few little changes I've made this time around, but there was really some extra, some, some more content I wanted to put in that first video. And I didn't because I kind of quickly realized that it was going to need an entire video to talk about this. And I'm kind of glad I, I kept that out. It's really a, there's really a connection here that I've kind of made and it had to do with, again, this conversation that I was having with this person that worked directly for Valent Biosciences, which is the really the producer of this insecticide that they're going to be spraying all over the city here in, in Mississauga, this 4A48B uh, substance here. And when I called him, we had really a, a great conversation. We talked about a lot of different things, but there's one thing that came up that was, it, it really stuck in my mind here. And I mean, this guy was really a wealth of information when it comes to this gypsy moth and really how they're controlling it and what it's doing out into the forests and what it's doing to the ecosystems. He was really a, a great wealth of knowledge just kind of speaking to him about this stuff. But one thing that he said, though, was actually that the, the biggest outbreaks that he's seeing here with this gypsy moth is really in the northeastern parts of the United States. And as soon as he said that, you know, some alarm bells started going off in my mind because really the northeastern part of the United States, it's really when you get into, you know, Connecticut, um, New Hampshire, Vermont, like these states here, which are really right next to Ontario too, right? And what I immediately saw was that there's a connection here between this gypsy moth and its behavior with really the very nature of Lyme disease. And I really knew there was a, a connection that was, was here, but I didn't put too, too much effort and research into it at the time I was doing the last video, where this past week I've been really looking into it and I've kind of, I found some interesting things here I want to share with you guys because it's stuff that you need to know on top of what it is that they're actually going to be spraying on us. There's, there's more to this story here that I'm, that I'm finding. And really one of the most interesting things that I, I, I found immediately was that when we look at Lyme disease, at least the first really reported kind of case of it, the first diagnosis of Lyme disease was really back in the 1970s. And that's, that's, I found that very interesting because I, just, I started to look into this, this gypsy moth outbreak. And I, started, I wanted to kind of find when was the first really reported case of this gypsy moth behavior kind of going all crazy here in Ontario. And I actually found something and the first reported case was actually in 1969. So we saw the kind of the first, the beginning stages of here of this moth kind of going crazy and attacking all the forests here and kind of destroying all the trees. And we saw that back in as, you know, as early as 19, uh, the late 1960s. And our first reported case of Lyme disease was in the mid 1970s. Now that's just the first reported case. That's when someone was clearly presenting with symptoms and finally we had actually had a diagnosis. But there's a long time period before that where there were, you know, this kind of disease was kind of really in the making here. And if we trace this back even a little bit further, you know, there's kind of the conspiracy theory side of this too, you know, from Lyme disease and where did it originate? Was it something, you know, artificially? Is it, is it synthetic? And that kind of takes you to, you know, going to, to Connecticut where we kind of first saw the presentation of this, this disease, Lyme disease. And it was right off what was called uh, Plum Island. 
and there's talk that there was actually some experiments going on on that Plum Island and they were playing around and the possibility of some of that you know that very spirochete kind of washed up on the shore here you know near near Lyme Connecticut that's kind of where you know this call really kind of began at least that's the story and what I found was when I kind of looked into that at those experiments that were done on Plum Island they were done in the in the, in the early 1960s so this is where we began to start playing around with this and then we kind of saw you know some of the, this, this gypsy moth behavior kind of come in the late 1960s and then we started getting reported cases of Lyme disease in the early 1970s and then it's been kind of a really a, a cyclic upward journey ever since then. Of course it wasn't just you know the northeastern part of the United States it kind of moves into Canada we get closer here to, to Mississauga and I've had Lyme disease and one of the Lyme disease experts that I saw in the very beginning when I actually found out kind of really what was going on with me which took about five years to kind of figure and figure this out and what I finally did when I finally saw this the specialist that I went to go see he I told him where I lived I told him I lived here in Mississauga he's like yeah this the city here in Mississauga is really it's really really bad with Lyme disease and he didn't use those words but he was really stating that it's it's really bad in and around this whole area here of Mississauga and kind of all the outskirts here so I really wanted to kind of find out what what's the connection here with, with the Lyme spirochete, and obviously there's some controversy on, you know, how it kind of shown up here, but at the same time, there's, you know, all this, this behavior going on here with this gypsy moth. I kind of wanted to kind of see what, is, is there a link here? And really when I started to kind of look into this, I was immediately kind of taken to uh, uh, a scientist's work. And there's a scientist by the name of uh, Dr. Rick Ostfeld. And this man is, has really been doing some really incredible work on Lyme disease and the very nature of how it kind of spreads throughout the, you know, the environment and kind of how it begins. And all the different rodents and critters that are running around the forest, how they become kind of infected with this Lyme disease spirochete and kind of how it spreads to humans. So he's been really researching this like crazy and he's been doing this really for the last 20 years. And he's uncovered some very interesting information here that I, I found and I kind of want to show you guys. And he works with a team of scientists that really just go out into the natural environment, out into the forests, doing all kinds of studies. And really what he found was that the number one carrier of this tick-borne disease is the white-footed mouse. Now this is really where it, it kind of really begins here in the ecosystem. And really with Dr. Osfeld's work, he's really shown that really it's, it's the deer that bring these ticks into the forest. And these ticks kind of fall off the deer and they're kind of laying on the forest floor. And of course, they, this is where they actually, they lay their eggs. And these eggs, they actually hatch in early August. Uh, that time of year is when these eggs hatch from their, from their cocoon kind of stage here. And when these ticks hatch, they're really, they're uninfected by this by the Lyme disease spirochete at this time. But what they do is they actually like to feed, their, fa their favorite feeding ground here is the white-footed mouse. And the white-footed mouse, like I said, is the number one carrier of this tick-borne disease. So if you see these things, guys, anywhere around your, your property, anything anywhere around your environment, pay attention to these. Because these are, you know, these are the, these are what are really bringing this infective agent into all of our environments. But really what's important when these ticks actually are, are born from the from the eggs that are in the ground it's not until the next year we move into what's called kind of the nymphal tick development stage this is now where they become highly infectious with this the, these tick-borne diseases that i just talked about and these ticks they really have a high infection rate of the uh, borrelia species of lyme the babesia species of lyme and the anaplasma bacteria which Really all three of them, if anybody is watching this that's actually had Lyme disease, they're, they're devastating infections. And I've actually had all three of them when I got tested. I've all, had all three of these. And I'm telling you, they're, 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 they're devastating illnesses and diseases to have. And when they start feeding on these white-footed mouse, that's really, the, that's really when you know, this infection, this, this is kind of the carrier for, the, for, the, for this infection. Now, what's really interesting about all this is, is that 
there's kind of an engine here that kind of drives kind of the, the population growth within the, the ecosystem here that Dr. Osfeld has found. And it has to do with the oak trees. It has to do with the actual, the acorn production on these oak trees. Because so many things within the forest, like this is their food supply. And when things in the forest get their food supply, you know, their, their population growth starts to, starts to happen quite rapidly. And what Dr. Ospel has found is that when we actually have what's called a, it's, it's actually what's called a mask year, a good mast year with the, uh, the oak trees, this is when they produce a, a really large amount of acorns. And the whole forest floor becomes kind of populated with these acorns. And that white-footed mouse that I just talked about, which is the number one carrier of this tick-borne disease that's running around the forest, and that nymphal tick, when it starts feeding on these rodents, or these, uh, these white-footed mouse, this is when that tick has the capacity to start infecting humans like crazy. But like, what's interesting about this is that this white-footed mouse, its main food supply is these acorns. So whenever these acorn, whenever there's a good mast year from these oak trees, which means they produce a large amount of acorns on the floor, the population of these white-footed mouse starts to starts to skyrocket. And acorns, what they're, what they're known for too, is that the, these white-footed mouse, they like to take them, they like to store them for the winter, and they actually last through the winter as well. So whenever we have a large influx of these acorns, this is when we're gonna see these white-footed mouse kind of go nuts. And these are what's carrying the Lyme disease. Now, I thought that was just extremely fascinating because we're kind of seeing really the intelligence of, of nature at work here, on how everything's connected together here. And we really need to be careful on how we disrupt these processes because what, I, what, he, what Dr. Osfeld was also making some interesting connections to was to this gypsy moth. Now, what's interesting here is that these white-footed mouse here, when the population of them starts to grow, because that year, there's a lot of acorns being produced from these oak trees. This large population of white-footed mouse, what they also like to feed on is these gypsy moths. And they feed on them when they're in kind of their cocoon stage. So when there's a good acorn year from the oak trees, the population of the white-footed mouse starts to rise. And when, the, when there's a lot of white-footed mouse in the, in the forest, they like to feed on these gypsy moth cocoon stages here. And what that does is it keeps the population of the gypsy moths at a, an, a, at a balanced level so that there is no outbreak. No outbreak is going to happen when there's a large amount of these white-footed mouse kind of running around the forest floor. And it all has to do with what controls these acorn, the acorn production on these oak trees. And even Dr. Osfeld says in his own words, he's like, we have no idea what controls the growth rate of these acorns or this mast year of these, of these oak trees on how, in order to predict when a good year is going to be coming or when it's going to be a slow year. It's completely sporadic and spontaneous. When we're talking about really the, the brilliance of nature at work here, it is completely spontaneous you're never gonna find any true repeating patterns on its fundamental behavior within an ecosystem like this. You're gonna find different connections and patterns, but really the heart and soul, this engine that's driving, this, this central intelligence engine here that's driving nature, it's completely spontaneous. So what this really kind of leads to is that when we have a massive gypsy moth outbreak like this, that goes and starts to destroy all the oak trees in the environment because that's their number one tree that they like to destroy first that's their favorite there's other trees too like birch trees and, and some other ones but it's primarily this oak tree that they go after so what i'm kind of seeing happening here at least the pure possibility of this happening here is that mother nature might be involved in this and it might be kind of working through these gypsy moths to kind of destroy all the forest oak trees in the environment 
so that we don't get any acorn production happening so that there won't be as many white-footed mouse running around the environment contaminated with Lyme disease in order to keep this infection of Lyme disease under control. And it may be actually the brilliance of nature actually trying to help us here. And I'm just suggesting the pure possibility of this because we don't know. We don't know what's controlling the acorn production growth of, production growth of these oak trees. And we really don't know why these moths are behaving the way that they are. So I'm just suggesting that there might be a, a bigger, something bigger going on in the background here to kind of help us because we know that Lyme disease is becoming a, a it's, it's always really been a, a silent epidemic here. If this disease is spreading like wildfire and it's the white-footed mouse that are the main carriers of this, then mother nature might be intelligent enough to kind of work through these gypsy moths in a sense their growth stages start to, to go out of control here to kind of, to kind of go out and attack the forest to stop the food supply for these white-footed mouse. Now, I think that's something at least we should consider here because we have to be honest with ourselves here, guys, that we do not understand the very intelligence of nature and how it works. We have no idea. And in my opinion, that has to do with our current scientific model that's out there. It doesn't include the very nature of intelligence in, in the science. It's, it's, it's gone. And the only thing we're left with really is a, an artificial intelligence that we're, we're, we're creating here as we move along. I mean, this is kind of the why Mississauga is turning into this smart city. It's going to be artificially controlled here. And artificial intelligence, the heart and soul of that, is really the control and manipulation of information. And I kind of talk about this in other videos too, on how we're kind of doing that, how we're kind of simulating our own information. And you know, I have a sense that it's not the way that Mother Nature is truly operating. There's something else going on in the background here, trying to keep things under perfect control for us here. But we're in front of that and we're trying to, we're, we're disturbing that on so many levels. So if we go out and we start spraying the city of Mississauga to try and kill off all these gypsy moths from destroying all these forests, when there very well could be something else going on in the background where Mother Nature is trying to help us to kind of control the spread of Lyme disease because it's going out of control, then what, what, what's going to happen here, guys? Well, what's going to happen here is we're going to have this insecticide is going to be sprayed all over us. And we've been talking about that. Jesse just did a great video on that one to kind of go over really the, the potential toxic effects of this that we need to be aware of. And it's really getting deeper and deeper and deeper what she's uncovering. So we have this to deal with. But at the same time, since we're going to be killing off a lot of these moths, and really we've got this, these, these white-footed mouse that are on the full forest floor, their population is, might be going out of control here. So we could have two potential disasters now, not just one like we talked about in my first video. And I think we have to be open-minded to this. And we have to realize that we don't understand the brilliance of nature here. We do not understand it. And we seem to be doing a fantastic job of just disturbing it on so many levels. And we could be headed in a place here, guys, that I don't even want to, I don't even want to go there in this video, but I think you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about here. And in that last video that I did as well, I talked about really the gypsy moths on how their metabolic kind of information system can be disturbed as well through the very nature of magnetism. And that magnetism is actually connected to the frequencies that we're using with the power grid. There's been studies already done showing that there is a disturbance that can happen there. So we, we have that as well, but with this new information that I'm presenting here too, we actually have the potential for the intelligence of nature to kind of work through these gypsy moths and kind of change the production kind of growth rate of these in order to go out and kind of do what I've been talking about here, about trying to control and kind of destroy the food supply for these white-footed mouse. And that same intelligence, at least in all my work and all my other videos are moving towards that direction, is that it may be controlled from this universal electric field in 
all of my work and what my work is moving towards, which is also connected to this universal rotating magnetic field that I'm beginning to kind of present here. And this is what I see on how nature might be, this is how nature acts through this. And it is something truly universal here that, I, that I'm beginning to present because the, the intelligence of nature is universal. It's not relative. So these relative sciences that we have here with quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, particle physics, Einstein's relativity with his idea of space-time, like these are not going to work because they're not truly universal. None of them are. So we're, we're missing that piece on how to connect into that universal dimension of intelligence here. And I'm suggesting it, it works through magnetism. So what we could have here is potentially a, a condition where that magnetic field in, in, in all of my work, and if we actually can get to a place to where we can actually connect it into the physiology of that gypsy moth to kind of show how, you know, there could be something bigger govern, governing what's going on here. And at the same time, you have that same magnetic field that has been altered and created by man that's not the same as this universal magnetic field in my work. That magnetic field actually has the potential to disturb that same physiology. So again, we're, we're kind of connecting both sides of the, of the equation here on how really the physiology of this gypsy moth, it can be disturbed or it can be controlled by the divine intelligence of nature. So there's two possibilities here that I think we really need to consider here and really look at the root cause of what could be going on here because we're, we're not getting to that. We're just, like I said, we're just kind of treating the symptom here and we're just going to be spraying this whole city and just starting to kill off all these gypsy moths when there could be something much more brilliant and intelligent going on in the background. And if we disrupt that, the more we keep disrupting nature like this, we're digging ourselves a bigger and bigger hole here. And the last thing I want to kind of talk about, just to kind of finish off this video here, it kind of goes back into Dr. Osfeld's work, and it has everything to do with what he's actually doing to try and control the spread of Lyme disease. Because he sees it as something that's spiraling out of control as well. When you look at all of his work and all his graphs, year by year by year, the infection rates are growing and growing and growing and growing. Especially all around the, the northeastern part of the United States and that bordering into to Ontario. And what his team are actually beginning to do, they actually started back in 2018. And when I just uncovered this, I was, again, deeply disturbed about the way that we're going about this and trying to control the ticks, these infectious ticks within the forest. And there's really kind of two methods that he's adopting. And he's testing these methods out onto different kind of smaller ecosystems within the United States. And he's been doing trials for a few years now. And the first method that he's actually using is he's using a, an insecticide. Again, it's something that's called a, car, a caricide. This is the insecticide that he's using. It's actually what's called MET-52. And again, they're claiming kind of the same things that we've been talking about with this gypsy moth, that this insecticide strain is something that's more organic something natural within the environment and if you look at this kind of spec sheet here too it's kind of the same type of spec sheet that we looked at with this 4a48b kind of showing you the percentage of the strain and the percentage of other ingredients and you can see here very clearly that it's very similar and dr osfeld and his uh this carry institute they're using this insecticide to spray a certain ecosystem and what this does it just it, it kills the ticks it kills all many different forms of insects actually and this is one method that he's using to try and control the level of these ticks becoming infected with Lyme disease from feeding off these white-footed mouse so that if there's less of them in the environment then that means there's going to be less chance for us to get bit by these ticks when we go out into the forest so that's the first method that he's doing and the second method that he's actually using is that he's actually using a, a genetic, genetically engineered um, fungus. And this fungus is actually what's called, I don't know if I'm gonna get the, the wording quite right on here, guys, so excuse me, but it's called Met Metarhysium bruninium. It's a microscopic fungus that actually lives 
underneath the forest, underneath the, the leaves in the forest floor. And it's a natural fungus that, that's there that we found a way to genetically engineer. So what Dr. Osfeld and his team are actually doing is that they're going out into the, a, a, a controlled ecosystem and they're putting this fungus all over the place in hopes that it will kill these ticks. And he's been working with this model for a couple years now and they seem to be getting some, some decent results because there seems to be less infected ticks in the environment when they're doing this. Now, again, this is just kind of in the beginning stages here, but if we see, you know, the, the Lyme disease infection rates, they keep going out of control, and these gypsy moths might be actually here to help us from this Lyme disease from going out of control, and we're trying to kill them off. Are you seeing, a, are you seeing what, what I'm seeing here? Like, this is, a, this is an absolute disaster in the making. On levels I've, I've never even, I, I don't even know what to say to think that this is the way that we're kind of going about this. And I, I completely understand if we, like, if we don't know how nature truly works, I mean, that, that's fine. I don't know why we can't be honest with ourselves. I think there's a lot of, you know, honor in that and saying that we don't know. We don't know what's going on here. But in the scientific community, we have to, we have to act. We have to do things. We have to try and go out there and try and get control of this. Because, you know, there's a lot of politics behind this too, clearly. But, oh man, guys, we're, uh, this is just a disaster in the making. And I'm hoping the right people can see this video to see that there might be some other variables involved in what's truly going on behind the scenes. I, I seem to think that there's really something to do with this electric power grid that's electrically grounded into the earth at all, posi all kinds of positions around the planet. It is disrupting, I would say, nature's kind of metabolic activity here. It, 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 it may be disrupting it in the right manner here to kind of alter really the behavior of different things that are out in the ecosystem. And I think that's worth looking into. It's worth testing and doing some experiments with it because we, we seem to be missing that. I mean, we look at what these scientists are doing at the, the Cary Institute. I mean, we have Dr. Osfeld, he's a, he's a, you know, an, a, a disease ecologist. He has other people on his team as well that are, you know, more physicians. And they have other people that are in the kind of the political side of things too that have influence there. So they got quite a really a nice, nice diverse team there. But I think they're missing really the electrical component here. The dirty man-made electricity that we've created here, both transmitting through these wires and transmitting through the air, this is affecting things. And I have a sense that it's affecting things on, on so many levels. We need to really pay, pay more attention to this. And I've had Lyme disease. I've suffered with this for almost a decade. It's just the last couple of years I've actually got myself to a really, really good place to where I can pretty much live a, a completely normal life now. I have some scars and wounds to deal with from all the things that I went to, but it's because of all the things that Jesse and I have been talking about on the internet. Like all this stuff really, it makes a difference. And one of the biggest things that I've, I've seen with the nature of Lyme disease is the connection to EMF. And this is one thing that I had to do early on and completely put a serious amount of effort in to kind of mitigate my environment from this. And this made just a, a, a world of difference for Jesse and I. And it's really inspired like all the work that I'm doing now with my business and going out into people's homes. People who are also very concerned about this. The people that I'm seeing are seriously chronically ill. And every time, I, every single time actually, I go into somebody's home and there's a sense of illness going on within the home, I find serious problems that are either coming from the wireless portion of that electromagnetic spectrum or stuff that's coming off these wires. It's the power that comes into your house. That seems to be the, the big one, but it, it never fails. And these people that are living in these homes, they're really chronically sick and some of them have diseases that could very well be 
underlying something, you know, like Lyme disease. So there's 100% a connection between the EMF in our environment with the spirochete and the way Lyme disease operates. And one of my early mentors, I actually have an enormous amount of respect for this guy, is Dr. Klinghardt in Germany. I mean, he's been, he's one of the most, he's one of the biggest Lyme disease experts out there. And he's even had Lyme disease. That's one of the reasons why I respect him so much. And he's been dealing with people for, you know, better part of 40 years. And what I've heard, I, I don't know this for 100%, I've, I've never been to his clinic, but if you want to go to his clinic and, and, and get treated for Lyme disease, what, I'm t what, I'm, what I've been reading is that he won't even actually see you, or he won't even put you through uh, any type of treatment program until you do some type of EMF re remediation in your home, because it's that big of a deal. So there's something going on with that, the very nature of Lyme disease, right at the heart and soul of it, with the nature of EMF and everything that has to do with man-made electricity. There's a connection there. I know there is. Instead of going out and spraying these ticks and spraying these gypsy moths that might be here to try and control these ticks, like we, we need to get to a, a deeper level here, guys and start doing some some deeper science about all this stuff and again i just i'm gonna stop there that's about all i wanted to kind of say in this video but i really wanted to kind of make a connection here between what's going on within the the behavior of these gypsy moths with this epidemic of lyme disease and i know i'm hitting some kind of controversial kind of subjects here but we need to I've been through Lyme disease and it's a devastating illness and anybody that I've known personally who have also went through it has just went through enormous amounts of suffering and if what I'm saying here has any truth to it about what's going on with the behavior of these moths and the connection to Lyme disease man guys we gotta we gotta stand up and do something here and stop these people from spraying this stuff all over the city of Mississauga. We need to, we need to act. We need to act on this. And I'm going to stop there. And again, I, I thank you guys for watching.